us for today's webinar on how many cycles to expect from your battery. Uh, my name is John Stavers and I'm the Vice President of Sales here at Epic. Uh, and I wanted to just share with you that over the last seven years, Epic has developed a world-class battery technology division with our engineering tech center located in Denver and manufacturing facilities in Boston and China. Leading that effort has been our division manager, Anton Beck, and our presenter today, Randy Ibrahim. Randy has been a leader in the battery and battery charger industry since the early 90s when he led the original initiative as CTO and VP of technology for ABT and Nexergy to create a smart battery and battery charger division. As the founder of Precision Battery, Randy's work includes pioneering the development of custom safety circuits, battery chargers for lithium sulfur chemistry, fuel gauging and battery chargers for lithium ion and lithium polymer chemistries. As a result of these efforts, Randy has received many patents in this area and has written numerous articles for industry trade publications. Over the past several years, Epic and Precision Battery have worked on well over 100 different development projects in the medical, military, portable device, and industrial sectors, which then utilize our state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Boston or our low-cost facility in Asia. Before I turn it over to Randy, I have just a couple of housekeeping items. First, if you have any questions during the webinar, rather than wait, please type them into your control panel located in the bottom right of your screen. Next, at the conclusion of the uh, presentation, we will compile the questions for Randy and he'll address uh, them at that time. And then, as always, we will be recording this webinar and posting it on our website for future reference. Lastly, should you have any questions following the conclusion of the webinar, please contact your Epic salesperson or send us an email through our website and we'll get you an answer just as soon as we can. Thank you again for attending and with that, I'll turn it over to Randy. All right. Thank you, John, very much for that introduction. You know, it's interesting um, on all our sales calls and customers that we visit, uh, you know, probably the number one question that we are all asked, you know, is, uh, you know, how many cycles am I going to get from my battery? You know, it's a pretty important question because it reflects to the uh, user experience. They have a certain expectation on how long their battery is going to last. The manufacturer of the product also, also has expectations on how long the battery is going to last because they have to warranty that battery. So, you know, it, you think on the surface it's a simple question, but uh, like all batteries in chemistry, there's a lot of factors and variations that can come into play. First of all, what we'd like to cover today are, is, are these various elements that come in to predicting the cycle life of a battery pack. Uh, first of all, the chemistry. You know, which, which chemistry is selected, which one's used. It, obviously, uh, in a perfect world, there would be only one chemistry, one that would give you infinite cycle life, one that would cost you zero amount of dollars, take up zero space, can run in all temperatures from extreme cold, absolute zero, all up to uh, you know, the, the sun temperature, and also the size would be infinitely small. So also we know that's unrealistic, and so we do have to pick a chemistry, and, um, and it's all based on the attributes of that particular chemistry. The, also, um, the amount of time the battery is actually exposed to temperature extremes uh, comes into play, as you'll see in, in the following slides. Also, the average charge state the battery's in uh, is a major role in the life expectancy of, of a battery pack. And also, how the battery is used. Uh, the discharge and charge rates, uh, how, you know, is it heavily used, is it not heavily used, they all factor in into in the cycle life of the battery. And also, uh, pack design. Now, this is an area that um, a lot of people overlook. They don't give it much thought because they think, hey, it's only cell dependent. But it, indeed, the pack design and how it's constructed has a major role in, in the cycle life of the battery. It's, it's something that a lot of engineers uh, need to be aware of. Uh, also, uh, lastly, but uh, on this major list, there's uh, hundreds more <laughs> that we could cover. But um, it, it would be mainly the number of uh, cells that are in the pack. Um, and the number of, uh, are they series cells, are they parallel cells? Uh, this also is important because now it's not just relying on one individual cell with its own life expectancy, 
but now it's depending on the neighbor cells to actually uh, turn into a battery pack. So, and, and how we uh, treat those cells is also very important uh, to the cycle life of the battery. So we'll first cover the chemistry selected and used. Um, as I mentioned, there is no perfect battery out there, so there are subsets of different chemistries, and each one has uh, various attributes that are really, um, you know, uh, that come into play that are either positive or negative. Um, you know, I guess there's a pun intended somewhere that all batteries have plus and minuses. But, you know, for instance, let's look at the lithium sulfur cell. You, a lot of you probably never even heard of lithium sulfur. It's actually a primary metal instead of an ion. And it's primarily primarily used in the military uh, area, and it's, even then, it's not widely used. Mainly, as you can see on the slide, uh, you're only only going to expect 20 to 50 cycles at best. And but it, but it has some really nice advantages. It's very very high energy density, very very lightweight. Uh, it, it, so there's some advantages that the military would love about this cell. It's expensive. Um, on top of that. But they're happy with 50 cycles because it meets their needs and it reduces the burden on the soldier. So it has a very niche market uh, use of that cell. But they don't expect more than 50 cycles. Uh, if you look at lithium ion, the next one down the list, uh, on average you get three to 500 cycles. Um, uh, the definition of lithium ion has really expanded over the years. I mean, there's a lot of subsets. They have a lot of different materials. And so that it's actually a whole family. In fact, one below that's kind of included in that family in, in, in to some degree. But on average, you're going to get three, 500 cycles. Now it's even pushing a little higher than that, depending on, on the subset chemistry that you, uh, that you select. But it's still, it's, it's reasonable. And we're kind of used to this. This is the chemistry that's in your laptop, your cell phone. You know, if you get a couple years of use out of it, and you're pretty happy. You know, you get a number of reasonable cycles. And, and then if you look at, uh, the other chemistry uh, below that, you know, the uh, lithium iron phosphate, uh, that particular chemistry, you get a lot better cycle life. Uh, you know, it shows about 1,000, 3,000 cycles. And with that particular uh, chemistry, you're giving up volume. You know, it's it's going to be a larger cell. It's going to be a little heavier cell. And so right away, when the trade-offs is, you're going to get some uh, uh, a little larger battery, but in exchange, you might get cycle life. And where this really could come in handy is sometimes some of our customers have batteries that are very, very difficult to replace. For instance, there could be an installation on top of a mountain, uh, and where you cost a lot of money, you know, thousands of dollars to get a team up there to swap out batteries. But these are type of chemistries that are really handy. Obviously, they're handy and portable as electronics as well. But you know, when you start looking at extremes and the cost of service, uh, those are factors that you look at uh, when selecting the chemistry. And then the uh, lithium titanate, uh, you know, obviously they're uh, the holy grail, get 20,000 uh, cycles. Uh, it does have some uh, drawbacks, actually, they're looking at the, uh, for the anode material, a lot of the automotive industry has some uh, great characteristics that are very desirable. So it's a, it's a good chemistry, but not widely used for a number of reasons. The next area, once you select uh, your chemistry that you want to use, uh, all the chemistries are affected by temperature. Uh, as the whole theme throughout this webinar, you'll notice, is uh, what keeps recurring is temperature. High heat kill batteries. Uh, that's kind of the underlying theme here. So this chart uh, clearly detects almost the exponential nature of how heat uh, does, a, uh, does affect the battery. If you look down here where my uh, cursor is, and let's say that we store the battery at roughly about 25 degrees C. And this chart here, just if you're interested, it's a lithium iron phosphate chart. Um, not that it makes a huge difference, but it does make a difference. The, uh, at 25 degrees C, in theory, you know, you're going to be getting, uh, in, this, uh, in the storage, if you just kept it, uh, you're going to keep a, a 15 year life on this battery. Uh, what's important, you're saying, okay, why does he have a, uh, a storage uh, chart on here when we're talking cycle life. Well, they really do go hand in hand when it comes to temperature. So this is a very good chart to show um, how uh, how exponentially temperature really does affect the battery. Now, if you come over here, let's say a good server market uh, in the let's say um, in a computer server area, uh, 40 45 degrees C is, is a fairly common temperature. 
And if you want uh, to define end of life as a 20% uh, or 80% remaining capacity, 20% uh, loss of capacity, which is this line depicts, then you're looking at, wow, okay, if you just increase it 20 degrees C, you went from 15 years all the way down to uh, roughly in the three-year range. Um, that's a pretty substantial loss in potential life of the battery just with a 20 degree uh, temperature change. And if you go down even further, down to 55 C, you're looking at uh, you know, less than a year. Here, if you, if you want to store it at 65 C at 100% state charge, you're going to be down to uh, you know, less than three months. So that, that's huge. And that's why uh, if you look at this, uh, the horizontal axis is in times square days. So it's, uh, it's the only way you can depict this exponential uh, decay of a battery. But another thing, that comes to the point when you see this, this graph, which is rather interesting. Sometimes petrol will say, well, okay, I have a battery. It has to be a 55C. I have no option. That's, that's the environment. But I need it to last a long time. A long time, let's say, here, this chart has 15 years. You say, okay, now if that's the case, what we could actually do, and we do this quite often, is if you look over here, if you oversize your battery 10 times, and you can uh, lose 90% of the capacity of that battery over 15 years, and your system still operates, well, there's a solution. And I'll see the cost is 10 times, you know, the size is 10 times, uh, the weight is 10 times. Uh, if, if that's a viable solution, what you do is you oversize your, your pack uh, to meet your life expectancy and your temperature. But the real takeaway here is you have to understand the effect of temperature and also how that influences and affects the design and selection of chemistry. Charge voltage is another major factor that affects uh, you know, the battery life, service life uh, of, of your pack. And uh, this is a pretty clear chart. I embellished it slightly um, uh, in, by adding some color. And what we have here is the effects of higher voltage on the uh, long-term effect uh, cycle life of the battery pack. Uh, right here, uh, if you look at the normal, uh, this is kind of even across the board, 4.2 volt um, lithium-ion charge technology, the standard lithium, the, the one that you saw earlier with the three to 500 cycle. I'm just picking this one here. The average, the standard charge voltage, everybody says, oh, pick 4.2 volts and you're good. So if you select the charger, you're gonna charge at 4.2 volts per cell. And, and life is good. The problem here is, let's say that you uh, select a charger and you're not aware of that small little changes in the charger uh, can happen, So, in, or you didn't, uh, are aware that slight voltage increases could drastically affect cycle life. And here's a good example. At 4.25 volts, only 50 millivolts overcharge, which is very, uh, very, very small. Um, here, normally, your 4.2 volt you're going to get roughly in the 500, a little less than 500 cycles per this chart. At 4.25, if you fall down to the green arrow, you just draw, lost about 100 cycles. You know, that's like over 20% capacity loss uh, just on a 50 millivolt overcharge. So what's really important here is to understand the charging system you're using. Make sure it, it's very accurate on voltage regulation. We normally um, want to stay within about 1%. On, on charge voltage, uh, current doesn't need to be that accurate. We current limit, but we voltage regulate uh, in order to make sure that we don't suffer from uh, from a uh, cycle loss inadvertently just from a, a poor design in battery charging. And also, you can see from this graph that um, it gets even worse if you get down to 4.35 volts, just 150 millivolts overcharge, and you're going from about 500 uh, cycles down to 150. It just kills your battery. And so this is definitely something to look at from an overall system standpoint. All these little things add up to cycle life. If you take care of everything that we're presenting today, uh, you'll maximize the cycle life of your battery pack. It's not any one item that does. Uh, the other side was, is current. We talked about voltage, and now we're talking about current. Charge current and battery degradation is, um, is, is very important. Um, Again, we're talking about heat here. You know, if you look at, if you if you step back for a second and you say, oh wow, let's, let's use some common sense here. If you discharge a battery rapidly, the battery warms up, that produces heat, and that's gonna affect the overall life of the, of the battery. 
So this chart I interpolated, as you can see, I added a little blue dashed line here, which just make it easier to read. Uh, in theory, the, uh, this particular battery is going to get over 600 cycles, uh, hypothetically, at, at 1C discharge rate. Uh, at, what they define by 1C is you take the battery capacity, that's C, and stands for capacity. So let's say uh, you had a 10 amp hour battery, a 1C discharge rate would be 10 amps, since uh, it corresponds with the 10, C, or 10 uh, amp hour capacity. So if this particular battery, if this was a 10 amp hour battery, we're discharging at 10 amps, it's, it's, it's good to go, we're going to get full cycle life, what we'd expect from this battery, assuming all the other things we talked about are under control. At the, uh, if, you, if you double that at QC discharge rate, you look at the red here, you just dropped your uh, discharge by one third, you're going to get less than 400 cycles uh, just by doubling the, uh, the discharge uh, current. Um, there is a note here that uh, some of the newer cells can handle the higher uh, rates. And that's true. Um, there's a such thing as called a power cell and energy cell. Power cells are designed to have the rapid discharge rates, a high discharge current. You see them in your drill motors. You see them uh, all over the place. The um, energy cell, they're designed to maximize the amount of capacity a battery has, but you can't draw as much instantaneous current from that battery. So um, if you do have, uh, do have to have a large discharge current, be sure you understand what cell is being selected and some of the trade-offs that are there. So it's very important to get back to the chemistry and the subsets and uh, the subset of subsets of the energy versus power cell. Now, if you look at the design, the pack design, you know this is the part that's probably most overlooked in any battery uh, when you're selecting a battery and, and working with a battery manufacturer. Uh, but it's actually a very critical part uh, for, for the previous reasons. Uh, this particular one, if you look at this chart here, uh, how you wire the battery internally it has a drastic effect on, on the uh, cycle life of the battery. For instance, if you look at the top uh, part of this uh, graph here, um, if you wire uh, coming right into the first cell and out of the first cell, that first cell becomes abused, especially when you have very high discharge currents. It's like the previous graph that I'll show you right here. If, let's say that first cell being a 2C discharge rate and the last cell being a 1C discharge rate. So let's say this cell uh, be exposed to 2C, and this is like 1C. I'm being extreme here. But um, you can see that this particular one cell is going to age much, much faster than if you were to wire it, as shown down below, where you have, where you're actually using the impedances of the wire and, and the nickel ribbon to, uh, to offset the impedances of the cells, where all cells are discharged at exact equal rates, and they're all exposed to something less severe than, a, let's say, a 2C, maybe it's 1 half C. But uh, uh, if you know all this is exponential, your cycle life of all three cells will be increased versus one cell dragging the pack down. The, um, the last that we like to cover. Obviously, there's a lot of factors involved in cycle life, but these are all the major care, uh, categories that we're hitting today. Uh, series cells. Now, all of a sudden, we've been talking about particular one cell type packs. Now, when you start putting them in series, um, every individual cell has its own like fingerprint. <laughs> you know, they come off the manufacturing line, and they uh, they're all ide ideally they're all the same, but they really aren't. There's going to be uh, microscopic changes in the manufacturing process from day to day, a lot, a lot. And each cell is, is very individual. There's no two cells in this, um, in this uh, world that are the same. So when you start putting them together, start marrying them up, and, and especially in a series combination, um, they, they, the series cells are what create and make a battery pack. And so now its neighbor it, you have to uh, rely on. And so um, if you go look at the, um, any misbalance or what have you, the uh, the cells, uh, the weak cells and the strong cells within the pack will affect the cycle life because when the weak cells are prematurely, uh, you know, turning off the battery pack, that's a safety trip because you go under voltage or over voltage, as the first bullet point here shows. Um, the charger must stop if it goes over voltage, and it's also true that when you know, when the first uh, cell, maybe the weak cell becomes empty, the charger must uh, must or the discharge. And, and so 
no one knows what the state of individual cells within a battery pack are, and but yet their perception is, hey, this pack is this is stopping too fast or not charging up all the way, and you see that in your laptop, and 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 so the perception is, I'm not getting cycle life, even though the individual cells, some of them within the pack, it, it live longer, but they don't because they're relying on their neighbor. Uh, the, the no weak cells uh, will age uh, faster than strong cells because there's higher internal pins in the weak cells. And when you run uh, current through uh, in pins, it creates heat, which causes it to uh, become weaker even faster, as we've seen in the earlier slides. And, um, and, and so the weakest link, as they show here, um, is what defines uh, the essential run time of the battery and, and how much energy that battery has and the perception if the battery is still good or not good. And um, one other item in here is the, the various temperature gradients within the pack. Uh, and that was uh, also on the, uh, the last slide. Um, it's, it's when you start getting a whole pack design, the internal cells that are physically contained in the middle of the pack, they're not uh, uh, at the edges of the pack where heat can uh, leave the pack or enter the pack. Those inner cells are kind of insulated by the outer cells, and they're going to age differently because they're kind of insulated, and they're going to have a tendency to heat up more, and then it will accelerate the, the aging process of, of the battery. And um, what's important is that you can offset some of these characteristics with what they call cell balancing. And that's uh, what the next slide here is. Um, with cell balancing, if you can picture this battery pack, let's say you have a lot of cells, pretend like it's an ice cube tray. And you have some of the, uh, uh, some of the lower cavities in the ice cube tray have a little lower water, some have higher water. And if you start rotating this ice cube tray, eventually you can get all the water level equal amongst all of, all of them. That's essentially what's happening with cell balancing in a battery pack. Because what you have, what you have are these strong cells and these weak cells. Ideally, you want to transfer some of the energy from the, uh, uh, or divert the energy, depending on the cell uh, balancing scheme that you're, you're picking. You want to divert some of the energy around the strong cells and feed them to the weak cells so they can come up this, uh, this speed. Uh, there's actually, we could give a whole presentation on just cell balancing because uh, you know, a lot of these are voltage-based and they really should be capacity-based cell balancing. Uh, because every battery actually has a different capacity. When you look at strictly voltage, you don't get the full picture. And, and, but this is still better than nothing. So if, with the, the main three cell balancing schemes out there, we have a capacitive uh, type um, uh, current redistribution. Uh, there's a little bit of electronics involved. This is fairly heavily used in the automotive industry because uh, it doesn't take up a lot of room. Uh, cost is everything in the automotive industry. And, it, and so this uh, this is a scheme that's uh, that's widely used. One of the uh, it's called pass. It, it, this is a, 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 a it, what they uh, call it. There's a passive, and then there's the active cell balancing. This is an active cell balancing uh, family. And then we have the inductive current, very similar. You know, if anybody knows electronics, it's you know capacitors and inductors almost opposite in their behavior. Um, but each one has a way of storing energy. One stores it in the electric field, in the capacitive, and then the magnetic inductive uh, type cell balancing uh, will take the energy, store it in a, in a magnetic field, and distribute it to the weaker uh, to the weaker cells. Uh, the nice thing about both these uh, uh, type cell balancing schemes, they actually cell balance during charge and discharge because there's very low energy loss, if any. Uh, and so you can be transferring energy uh, without producing a light heat between the weaker and, and, and stronger cells, regardless of charge or discharge. If you look at the last uh, item here, the, the passive, uh, the current bypass method, and this is fairly common, it's least expensive, uh, least uh, intrusive, it's really nice with portable electronics because it takes a very, very, uh, very small amount of space, it doesn't put out a lot of heat, um, but there you do lose some, uh, uh, some energy. This particular uh, cell balancing scheme ideally uh, is done during the charge cycle and mainly done towards the end of the charge cycle when the, when the uh, current is tapering off um, uh, and, and, and more current available for the actual cell balancing. So to summarize everything we talked about, the, um, the main bullets here, obviously uh, chemistry is very important. 
And that's the first place you start if you want. Uh, if psycholife is important to you, and sometimes psycholife may not be important. You know, more likely, you're not listening right now. If that's true, um, but it, it's there are trade-offs, and so you, obviously you're not going to pick the highest psycholife battery because you may not like the price, you may not like um, other factors, you may not like the fact it can't uh, provide a lot of energy um, uh, very fast or rapidly. The um, also, the, uh, 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 what you really, really want to look at is the, um, the, the t temperature, you know, and that's why I put this as the kind of the right after chemistry was this slide was very important, that the amount of time that the battery is exposed to temperature extremes, um, and then you look at the, uh, the charge current and, and, and then the charge, um, you know, state of charge of the battery, the discharge current, all these things that contribute to, uh, to temperature of the battery, and you definitely want to pay close attention to all those factors. I'll say the pack design, we cover that. And um, their takeaway there is definitely uh, work with a company that understands it. Um, that just don't take a cookbook engineering design and put it on a, on a PC board and, and, uh, and, and make sure they really truly understand the uh, inner workings of how this, uh, how the pack really needs to be designed and pulled together. And lastly, of course, if you can minimize the number of series cells, that's always ideal because uh, your pack will live longer. Sometimes that's not possible. But if, if, it, if it's not, then the, depending on your budget and, and your criteria, you definitely want to uh, incorporate cell balancing in your pack. Uh, thank you, Randy. Uh, while the questions uh, that you uh, typed in are, are being reviewed so that, uh, that we can answer them, I just wanted to share with you that, uh, that Epic possesses a comparable uh, capability to design and deliver uh, solutions, not just in battery packs, but also in uh, rigid boards, flex and uh, rigid flex boards, uh, the very high reliability user interfaces, uh, cable assemblies, and, uh, and also energy efficient fans and motors. Uh, next slide, please. And, uh, and that's done through use of uh, the various design centers and support centers that we have located uh, not just in the States, but also in Europe uh, and in uh, China. Uh, that said, uh, I'll turn it back over to the team to, uh, to answer your questions. Next slide. All right. Yeah, I was just looking through. A couple of these are coming through. And now, these, these, that, you know, just skimming over on the, I'll pick the easy ones, <laughs> you know, uh, that's the type of guy I am. But anyway, um, you know, this one's actually interesting because uh, it does, um, it flips on the other side of, uh, of a chart I did show. Now, I'll, I'll go back to that chart. But it, the question is, um, I heard that you can get better cycle life uh, if you undercharge the battery. Uh, you show a graph uh, of overcharge. Um, what does undercharging look like? And I believe the graph that uh, is being referred to, if I go back here, um, let's see here, uh, right here. Um, and it's true, it, it, this particular graph I showed, uh, if you overcharge the battery, how it drastically affects cycle life? So this is actually a good question. What happens instead of uh, up here I show a 4.2 volt and going up higher, what happens if it's less than 4.2 volt? And uh, I'm glad this question was asked because if, if you look at this, in fact, there's a lot of um, areas where we will uh, suggest you don't use 4.2 volts uh, in, in certain applications where, let's say the battery is already a large battery and I mean, the next size cell that we could use was more than they really needed. So why not drop down uh, the voltage down to, instead of 4.2 volts, let's drop it down to 4.1. And what that buys you is about two times the uh, cycle life which is pretty incredible. So uh, it's, uh, instead of just living with the higher capacity battery that you really don't need the initial capacity, why not lower that voltage initially? And you're only getting down to maybe 90, you know, less than by 95% charge state, so you're still doing quite well on the initial charge. But uh, the trade-off there is you are going to get uh, about two times the cycle life. Uh, in some instances, we actually drop it down to 4.05 volts. And if I recall, I want to say it's somewhere um, by, you know, probably 2.7, 2 2.8 maybe times, pushing three, three times the, uh, the capacity. And then after that, it, it's almost a rule of thumb that we use. For every 0.1 volt that you drop, you essentially double the uh, cycle length. And um, I might say capacity earlier, I meant cycle length. So you look at this and you say, okay, let's hypothetically drop it down to four volts. And 
there we're going to get four times the capacity. You know, 3.9, the rule of thumb is eight times, 3.8, you know, uh, now we're getting crazy, but it's about 16 times uh, cycle life. I mean, you can get a huge number of cycles, and sometimes it makes sense that you do this. Uh, 3.7, which we've never done, um, uh, it's about 32 times the cycle life. 3.6 doesn't make sense because the, at that point, it's about the, <laughs> the voltage of the battery uncharged. So uh, that's really, um, uh, you know, the what you can do, because that means you're not charging the battery at all. But the, it's interesting. I, I like the question, and we've done it. We've done a lot of the 4.05s, 4.1s to increase cycle life, especially when the customer really doesn't need that um, initial capacity and the packs are way oversized. Let me get back to our slides here. Okay. Okay, the um, another question. Um, yeah, this is interesting. This person must be actually from uh, from uh, uh, knows quite a bit about uh, chemistry. Uh, it's a, do you really need cell balancing, even if you use the cell from the same lot? Um, for those that don't know the manufacturing process, uh, when we're building up packs, uh, we uh, the, the battery the cells themselves before we build up the batteries come in boxes, and in those boxes there's lot numbers. Uh, one requirement we always make when we build a pack is we always use cells from the same lot. Uh, even if there's leftovers in the box, we will not use those cells. Those will be used for uh, customers with, when they have a one S1P, which is a single cell pack, where it doesn't matter what lot it came from. So um, it, it is very, very important. The reason is that's your first line of defense is taking cells from the same lot. Reason being, I mentioned it earlier, is Every cell is individual. Every cell has its own fingerprint. Everyone has its own characteristics. You increase your odds of having cells close, closely matched in capacity if you get them from the same lot, because they're ideally manufactured the same day, same material, the same atmospheric conditions, you name it. Everything's there. So we do pick cells from the same lot. Um, but the question really is, do you need it? Do you need cell balancing? Well, it is your first line of defense. It, it, you're, there's a good chance your pack will live a long life, but you have to ask yourself a question, okay, what's this pack going to be used in? How many cells are in series? Is it only a two-series pack? Well, okay, if it's a two-series pack and it's uh, a, a very low-cost product that, uh, and you need to be competitive and you're, and you're using a high-quality cell, then maybe the answer would be no. Maybe you don't need cell balancing in order to be competitive. Uh, you, may have, you may expect to replace a pack more often. And, Maybe, maybe or not, the user might uh, see that as a bad experience or not, depending on, on what the end product is. So there are some judgment calls that need to be made. Uh, if you have a really high series count pack, you know, a, a 20 series, a 30, you know, yes, I don't care what, the, what it is, you're going to need it. Um, and you do want the, the cell balancing in there. Um, and so the lot is important. Uh, it, it's something we do routinely. but um, you definitely want to um, make sure that, uh, that that you use it in, in um, applications where it's really critical. Medical applications, if it's 2S, we use cell balancing. Uh, regardless, we want to make sure that uh, these batteries don't fail in the field. So it, it really is a judgment call. And going through the, let's see here. Okay, um, it takes me a second to read. I'm a slow reader. Uh, okay, here. <laughs> how does um, how, this question here is how does a low temperature affect cycle life? Uh, you know, I really don't have any data on this. Uh, I, we've done quite a few low temperature applications. Uh, we get kind of crazy. We put heaters and batteries. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do um, to help. Uh, uh, have batteries run at low temperatures. Uh, but the general theme here, again, was heat kills batteries. Well, this is no heat, low heat. Um, so it will help cycle life, regardless. In fact, the rule of thumb is uh, if you're not using your camcorder battery, uh, just charge it halfway, throw it in your refrigerator until you need it next time. Uh, you're going to get a very, very long life from your batteries. Um, it, uh, you can do that with your cell phone, but you know, may, may lose it. Um, it does help since heat does kill. Uh, there's other factors involved, though. Um, low temperature, just like a car battery, is, uh, really cold winter mornings, it's hard to start because 
uh, the available capacity, even though the battery has capacity, it's fully charged, the available capacity to use is much less. And, um, and Sarah, so a lot of times with the, with the low battery, it, you're going to get the long life of it, but it may not actually meet your need as far as uh, being able to um, give you the instantaneous energy you need. It depends on your application. If your application draws very, very low power, then one battery could work and you could have enough energy coming from the battery at very low temperature and in your battery would one live a long time and be able to uh, supply, supply energy that your product needs. On the other hand, sometimes um, uh, the high current discharge or, or the radio transmitters that need instantaneous power, uh, the voltage will dip you know, with really cold batteries. So sometimes we recommend oversizing the battery, putting more chemistry in there. Um, uh, also, if, if you don't need it instantaneously, we actually put a preload on the battery to allow internal heating within the battery to come up to be able to uh, sustain a voltage. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that we can do. But uh, the, essentially, the answer to life, uh, the answer to the question is yes, you will uh, increase your um, your cycle life of your battery pack at low temperature. You may have operational issues that are separate from that, but you will get better life. That's it for right now of the questions I can answer. <laughs> Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. Thank you all.